neighbor, neighbor. It's, time it's time to get off the porch. That's what we're talking about today. Get off. Get off the porch. Get off the porch. Listen, while it is commonly true that God has divinely designed our destiny, it is also true that we have a common enemy who we call the devil. This common enemy desires our destruction. He desires to distract us. He desires to deter and detour us. He desires to destroy us, and he uses subtle weapons to throw us off track. He uses a lack of achievements. He uses a lack of accomplishments. He uses dissolving and deferred dreams, and he uses goals that seem to be further <clears throat> and further away. And these are all designed to make us doubt our destiny. They are designed to make us come to a false realization that we must accept that there is no way to have a positive response out of this negative experience that we're going through right now. And so I thought I'd come today to talk to somebody who feels trapped. I thought I'd come to talk to somebody today that feels stalled. I thought I'd come to talk to somebody today because this message is designed to challenge us who, who have areas in our lives where we've decided to remain at an acceptable level of mediocrity. My message to you is it's time to get off the porch. <clears throat> This message is designed for those who are tired of getting ready, but you never get started. My message for you is, it's time to get off the porch. This one is for people who, are, who come to the church weekly, but then live weekly. My message for you is, it's time to, to get off the porch. But I, I want you to know, getting off the porch is not going to be easy. If it was easy, nobody would get stuck on the porch. It's going to require some energy and some effort to move from possibility to probability, but that's exactly what happened to this nameless man by this famous pool in our text. I don't know about you, but when I read the Word of God, I often read, uh, I read between the lines to try to anticipate the action. I like the build-up. I like to be able to watch, just like in a movie. When you're watching a movie and something is about to happen, they know how to play music that moves you to the edge of your seat. They know how to set you up for the setup. They know how to play a smoke and mirror trick and have you looking at the left hand while the right hand does something that knocks the wind out of you. And even in the Bible, there are some things that will let you know that something special is about to take place. Listen, listen to what the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which had five roofed colonnades. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, he hear this, hear this. The Bible says, look at the action. Jesus shows up at the sheep gate. Come on, Bible readers, think about it. Jesus shows up at, at the sheep gate. The chief shepherd shows up at the gate where sacrificial lambs are kept. This lets me know something special it is about to happen. Jesus, who is also called the Lamb that was slain. Remember, he was coming to be baptized by John. John pointed him out and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So now the sacrificial lamb shows up where substitutionary sacrificial lambs are kept. This lets me know something special is about to happen. You're not seeing it. Let's look at it another way. The chief shepherd, the Lamb of God, wrapped up in one person, shows up at the place where sacrificial lambs were kept, and it's called the sheep gate. And look at what he did. <clears throat> he went to a pool named Bethesda. Everybody say Bethesda. Bethesda, Bethesda means the house of mercy. Beth, the prefix means house of, and then you have the meaning. Like Bethel means house of God. Bethany means house of figs. Bethlehem means house of bread. And now 
we have the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the lamb of God that was slain for my sins, the lamb that takes away my reproach, the lamb that takes away my blemishes, the lamb that takes away my sins showed up at the house of mercy. Some of y'all missed that. Maybe you don't realize you need a little mercy in your life. Is there anybody here that, that needs a little mercy in your life? I know we sing amazing grace, and I love grace, but grace is for my sin. I need some mercy for my situation. Who am I talking to today that can stand a little mercy for your situation? Who? The Bible says, that when he showed up to this pool, this pool had five porches that covered those who were laying by the pool, hoping to be helped by the mercy that was promised by the troubling of this medicinal pool. Legend says that an angel would come down once a year and trouble the water. And the first person in the water would be healed of whatever was hampering or hindering them. Notice, if you will, that Jesus showed up. Somebody say he showed up. Uh, but when Jesus showed up, everybody didn't get healed. The healer showed up, but everybody didn't get healed. The miracle-working master showed up, but everybody did not receive a miracle. And that shouldn't be so strange to you because every Sunday people show up in the sanctuary. Come in hurting and leave hurting and the healer was in your presence. We come in sick and leave struggling because we did not take advantage of the powerful presence of the Prince of Peace. We, we, we show up at a place every week where our souls can be healed. We show up at a place every week where our problems can be solved. We show up every week at a place where our burdens can be lifted. We show up on holy ground, but we never get holy help. That's why when I come to the sanctuary, I make sure I'm not just satisfied with being in your presence. I came to get in his presence. Don't, don't, don't take me wrong. I love all of y'all. You look good. You look cute, but I didn't come to see y'all. I came to get in in, in his presence. I came because I need some, I need him to trouble some stuff in my, I wonder am I in here by myself? Is there anybody that, that needs to know you're in the presence of God? I need some people in here right now, about 200 people that will let me know you need some proof that you've been in God's presence. You didn't just come here to smile and shake hands. You came here to leave differently. You can't. All right, I'm by, I'm by, I'm by myself. Why I don't come to church and watch the worship team. I have to lift my own voice and say, pass me not. Oh, gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Tell somebody it's time to get off the porch. Backing up to verse 3 again, says this, In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Listen to verse number 4. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Listen, anybody ready to get off the porch today? Let me just... Here it is. Getting off the porch... Is good, but it can be tough when I'm confined by a sad situation. <clears throat> Getting off the porch can be tough when I'm confined by a sad situation. This man, I still don't know his name. Let's just call him Baby Bobby. I, 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 here is Baby Bob at the pool. Surrounded by sick people. And you know what happens when you're surrounded by sick people? You get sick. He's surrounded by lame people. You know what happens when you're surrounded by lame people? You start acting lame. He, he's surrounded by blind people. You know what happens when, you when you're surrounded by blind people? You stop seeing. Then he's surrounded by paralyzed people. And you know what happens when you're around paralyzed people? 
you stop moving. He's in a sad situation and he's trapped. He's confined in this sad situation. Even if he wanted to move, he couldn't move. Somebody in here today, you're surrounded by a sad situation. A situation where the people you're surrounded by have no strength. The people you're surrounded by can make no difference. The people you're surrounded by can make no changes. Even if they wanted to, they didn't have what it took to pull themselves up. They did not have what it would take to better themselves. How, how, how many people are here? Don't raise your hand because I don't want you to tell your business. But how many of you are surrounded by people who need help but can't help themselves? How many of you are surrounded by people and you need help and they can't help you? You got to check your circle. Somebody say, check your circle. The danger of having a circle is when you go in a circle, you end up right where you began. Watch your circle. He was surrounded in this sad situation, and they showed up at the temple, but they stopped at the porch. They were in the right place to get help. They were just out of position. We just go talk for a second. Is that all right? Because somebody in here, you're in the right place. You're just in the wrong position. You're in the right place to get help, but your mind is somewhere else. You're in the right place to get help, but your heart is somewhere else. You're in the right place to get help, but your emotions are somewhere else because somewhere life has you stuck in a sad situation. I, I don't know if I would have known what they knew about the temple. If you think there's healing on the outside of the temple, what about if you go on the inside where his presence is? Why would you settle for what an angel can do and miss out on everything God can do? He stayed on the porch, I believe, because he got comfortable commiserating with those who identified with his misery. Yeah, you know, we love to awfulize, catastrophize, and commiserate. The first two I made up. The first two words I just made up. <laughs> awfulize, catastrophize, and commiserate. We love trying to win the trophy for who suffered the most. How was your week, girl? I had a headache all week. You ain't had no headache till you had the one I had. I ain't been feeling till I was sick all week. You ain't been sick like I've been sick. You ain't been down like I've been down. You ain't been broke like, why do we look for a trophy for suffering? Like you got to outdo me in whose life is the brokest. We love socializing in these sad situations. You ask somebody, hey, how you doing? Well, you know, my back went out, my head is hurting, I don't see like I used to, my money is funny, my car acting up, my husband won't come home, my wife just cussed me out, my children don't talk to me, but other than that, I'm all right. What's left? How long have you been stuck in a situation surrounded by people who stop dreaming? How long have you been stuck in a situation surrounded by people who stop having hope, who believes this is the best life has to offer? How long have you been hurting and okay with it? How long have you been disappointed? How long have you been miserable? How long have you been knowing that you need to change but you're satisfied remaining unchanged? I'm afraid that many believers in America have become so comfortable on the porch that they've given these premises a bad name. We've become so comfortable in who we are, we forgot that you ought to leave different. Nobody met Jesus and left him the same way. What's our problem? The sanctuary should be a place where you come in crying and you leave saying, God will wipe my tears away. The sanctuary should be a place where you come in beat down, but you leave out saying, God lifted my head and now I will look to the hills 
from where my help comes from. What happened? I believe our ungodly patience has given a godly place a bad name. We've sat down and decided to wait on God when God is waiting on us. But I came to tell somebody today that your current situation does not dictate your common conclusion. I don't care how you came in here, you can leave differently than you can. I wonder, do I have about 50 people that will make up your mind today? I'm not leaving here the same way I came. I'm not leaving here with the stress I came in here with. I'm not leaving with the anxiety I came in here with. I'm not leaving with the worries I came in here with. I'm not leaving with the same disappointments. I'm throwing them all in the pool. So getting off the porch can be tough when I'm confined by a sad situation. Let's read verse 3 again. In these, in this situation, lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years years. Listen, getting off the porch, number two, can also be tough when I'm comfortable with the miserable multitude. It was a pool full of sick people waiting on something to happen that only happened once a year. I'm concerned because I, I, I really do believe He'd given up hope and just settled for living through hell. How do I know? Uh, I don't think he expected to be healed. Well, why do you say that? The Bible doesn't say that. No, I'm just looking at the text and using what uncommon sense. You don't want to call it common sense no more because that ain't altogether true. The Bible, know, listen, the writers of the Bible know how to count. God knows how to count. He knows how to use units. Sometimes the Bible said, and there were 10. Sometimes there were hundreds. Sometimes there were thousands. But then it gets to a point where the Bible just calls them multitudes. And a multitude literally translated means a whole bunch of people. And the Bible says there was a multitude of sick people around the pool where only one person could get healed a year. Let's subtract and let's just say that there was one person there for every day in the year. 365 sick people, leap year, 366 people around the pool. If one person a year got healed, how long you got to live hurting before you get And some people surround themselves with the misery of the multitude because misery loves. Everybody he was surrounded by was as bad as he was. 38 years he had been in his condition. I don't know if he had been in this position for 38 years, but I know he had been in this condition for 38 years. I hope. He wasn't at the pool, HT, 38 years. I hope he was smart. Listen, ain't nowhere in the world I'm going to be somewhere and not get it right at least one time in 38 years. I, I ain't, he, he was an invalid. He, he could move a little bit. Maybe his arms work. You mean to tell me, I don't care how far back he was from the pool, but in 38 years, you couldn't have just... Don't laugh at him. How long have you been stuck in your situation? You ain't tried to crawl out. You ain't tried to walk out. You ain't tried to roll out. You just stuck like Chuck. Here's 
is the problem. When you're surrounded by miserable people, you can't expect to find motivators or mentors. When you're surrounded by sick people, abnormal starts to look normal. Irregular starts to look regular. Sick starts to look well. And the problem with the misery, here's the problem with the misery, it's addictive. And it's stronger than any controlled substance. And once you get a taste of misery and the company of misery, whenever you hang around people who are miserable, you relapse. Even on that one day when the water is troubled and one somebody gets healed and for a little while you start feeling like next time may be my time, the misery kicks back in and you relapse. Some of us are surrounded by sick people. Some of us are surrounded by people that make us sick. And some of us are just surrounded by people we sick of. He was surrounded by blind people. Blind people have eyes but could not see. Some of you are surrounded by blind people who are looking and you don't even know it. How do you know they're blind? Because every time you tell them what God is going to give you, they tell you, I can't see it. I don't see how you're going to come out. I don't see how you're going to do it. I don't see how you're going to make it. You're blind. You can't see. You need to wear some glasses like DMC. Y'all too young to know about that. Not only was he surrounded by blind people, he was surrounded by lame people. Lame people limp in the present because of problems of the past. You're surrounded by people who tell you what you ain't going to be because of who you used to be. You, you'll never have because you, 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 of who you used to be. I remember, who, y'all, some of y'all know you got some lame people in your life. That's why you can't say amen. If you can't say amen, you're the lame people in somebody's life. You are lame people. You still mad about something that happened when you were in the third grade. You still mad at somebody that pushed your milk off the table, talked about your mama, called you fat, called you ugly. It's been 45 years and you still limping from a past hurt. Somebody didn't call you back. You wrote that little note, do you like me? Check yes or no. They didn't send it back, you still mad. Let it go. They ain't stopping you. They ain't thinking about you. You can't sleep. You can't eat. You can't grow. God can't even bless you because you're still. Then there was some paralyzed folks. Paralyzed people couldn't move at all because past trauma still has some present ramifications. And some of you surrounded by paralyzed people. You don't know how to love because they can't love because one somebody hurt them. All men are dogs. No, just the one you attract, Ruth. Listen, dogs only chase dogs. Somebody talk to me. Let me come down here. If all men are dogs, what are you? I ain't never seen a dog trying to take a cat to the prom. I ain't never seen a dog trying to date a duck. Still paralyzed. Your sixth grade crush broke your heart. You can't trust nobody. Ain't no good people out here. No, you just don't know good people. Quit it. Stop it. Listen, once you heal the part of you that attracts bad people, you can meet some good people. But there are some things good people ain't gonna deal with. Ain't no good man gonna deal with all the hell your old man done sent you through.
Ain't no good woman gonna put up with you. Listen, ain't no good woman looking for no man to raise. Don't look now, but it looks like you just found out your circle is really a noose. What's supposed to be complimenting you is choking you because you're surrounded by this misery. You're diverted, diverted, detoured. Your dreams are delayed and your destiny has been diverted because you're hanging around people who are diseased with doubt and it's infectious. You hang around people who are terminal, but they are functional with their fatal faithlessness, and now it's rubbing off on you. You like hanging around this crowd because you ain't as bad as everybody else. I'm bad, but I ain't that bad. So you like hanging around them because they make you feel better. Bragging, huh? I'm, you know, I'm, me and my circle, I'm good. We all, no, we all ain't got to struggle. I don't want to hang around everybody that's struggling. I need to know how it looks to soar. I don't want to hang around everybody who's struggling to put gas in their car like me, barely living day to day. By. I need somebody who got a gas station. I need somebody who owns the dealership. I need somebody that builds houses. I need some, listen, I need to hang around somebody that's got what I need so they can show me how to get it. No, you want to be around people that make you look good so you can act like you're the big fish. You're a big fish, but you're a big goldfish in a bowl full of guppies, so you ain't that big. How long are you going to stay satisfied keeping company with no comfort? Let, 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 let me move on. Listen. Verse number six. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Sick man said to him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred and while I'm going down, another steps in before me. Listen, getting off the porch is tough. Number three, when I'm challenged by the facts of my failure. <laughs> Baby, you Bobby was focusing on what he couldn't do and almost missed what Jesus came to do. I, I wonder how many people here today came in looking at your failures, excluding your faith. If Jesus was holding your failure against you, none of us would have woke up this morning. But if he woke us up this morning, it's because he valued our faith over our failures. I need to see who I'm talking to so I know how to close this. Is there anybody here that's ready to lay your failures to the side and cash in on your faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you're going to get addicted to a substance, get addicted to your faith. i got to believe what my eyes haven't seen. i got to believe what my hands haven't held. i got to believe in where my feet have never gone. Here's the scene. Here comes Jesus walking on the pool. It's a multitude of people, and he's stepping over sick people. Do you want to be made well? He done went through all this to get to you, and then you answer ask you, I don't have nobody. I didn't ask you who you didn't have. I ask you, do you want what you don't have? Y'all pray for me, but this burns me up. Don't answer a question I didn't ask you. This is a yes or no. I don't need no yes. Or do you want to be well? Yes. 
seems like a silly question to ask a sick man till you listen to his response. Because some people don't want to be healed, they just want to be right. Some people don't want to be helped, they just want to be right. I'm right because I ain't got nobody. You can be right or you can be helped. Just, you know, baby, you Bobby, he, he wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. He was a few fries short of a Happy Meal. How, how do I know that? Sister, oh, you'll appreciate this. I know you'll appreciate this. He said, I have nobody. Here's my question. Which one of your nobody friends you thought was going to help you? Your blind friend? Your lame friend? Or your paralyzed friend? Doesn't that sound a little silly? Well, let me ask you, why are you still hanging around your blind friend? Why are you still laying up with lame people? Why are you still paired up with paralyzed folks? I got some good friends. Let me ask you a question. If your rent and your car note or your mortgage was due because you got sick and couldn't pay it, which one of your friends could you call to pay it for you? If you only got an answer, you have no man. If your car breaks down, who can loan you one or give you a ride? None of my friends. Then you have no man. He said, sir, of course I would want to be well, but the system won't let me. I want to be better, but the system is holding me back. What's, what's the system? One person, one time a year, who gets in first. We got too many people who are stuck on the system. Because, I mean, when you're surrounded by people who are in the same shape as you, how much help can you hope for? And if you're counting on the system, the system is not always favorable to your situation. The system said only one person could get healed. But your system ain't working. And we got some people right now who are stuck on the system. Wondering why your life ain't changed. The system is I show up on Sunday. But that's all the Lord going to get from me is on Sunday. I mean, you show up at every service, but you don't hear no sermons because you're caught up in the system. You show up for service, but you never serve because you're caught up in the system. You think being here, getting my ticket punched, is going to change my life around. No, you're just systematically oppressed and you don't even realize it. need to explore another recourse outside of your resource because if showing up on Sunday alone ain't getting it for you, you got to try something different. If what you gravitate toward doesn't gratify you, it's time to give it up and look for something different. Sir, you want to get well? I ain't got nobody. Because every time I try to get in. Somebody gets in before me. What kind of cooperation can you expect out of a competition? We surround ourselves with people who are always competing with us. Listen, people don't mind you climbing the ladder of success. They just got a problem when you leave them behind. People don't mind you getting ahead. They just don't want you to get ahead of them. And too many people come to the church, the system, looking for heal them. When church is not the cure, Christ is the cure. But you've never cultivated a relationship with Christ because you got caught up in church. It's time that we stop sitting on the premises 
and start searching for the promises. Says, sir, you want to be well? I ain't got nobody. Jesus said, man, I ain't got time for all that. Get up. Take up your bed. Get your back off your bed. Then make up your bed. Whenever you get out of your bed, make your bed. Anybody else grow up like that? No, no, you don't, you don't, you don't, I can't even get in the bed that's not made. If I come in the house and the bed ain't made, I got to make it up before I can unmake it to get in it. Because my mama taught me when you get out the bed, you got to make your bed up or you'll be tempted to lay back down. The reason some of you lay back down with the wrong people, with the wrong mindset, with the wrong practices is because you didn't make your bed up. He said, get up. Make your bed because you'll never lay down in this place again. I got to go, but I need to tell you, your tomorrow doesn't have to be a rerun of your today. All you have to do is make up your mind that I'm tired of being around sick people. Make up your mind that I'm tired of waking up hurting and going to sleep hurting. Is there anybody in the sanctuary that's ready to get off the porch today? Is there anybody here that's ready to tell the Lord whatever you want me to do? I'm ready to do it. I'm tired of, I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of being in pain. I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of being knocked down. Is there anybody here that's ready to get off your bed? Is there anybody here? That's ready to stop crying. Is there anybody here uh, that's ready to start winning? I've got to close here now, uh, but I know uh, there's no pool in the sanctuary. But I want you to know uh, this man got healed, and it wasn't even on the day when the water got troubled, uh, which lets me know uh, whenever Jesus shows up can be your day. Uh, is there anybody here that knows he's in the room right now? Can you feel him moving? Uh, won't he make you wave your hand? Won't he make you leap for joy? Yes! He's moving right now. Moving in my heart. Moving in my mind. Uh, is there anybody here that's ready to get up, go on, uh, and see what God can do, what God can do? like this, but I feel him moving right now. Anybody know you're getting off the porch? Anybody know your life is going to be different? Well, if you don't mind, I need you to help me testify for a minute. If you don't mind uh, sharing your testimony, uh, stand on your feet. It's not for the cool people, it's for the saved people. Slip your arms around the neighbor's shoulder. Tell a neighbor, he's moving in my life. So when I move, you move just like that. When I leave, you leap just like that. When I sound, you sound just like that. Yeah!
tell somebody today can be your day. I'm not going back the same way I came. You need a bed, I'll loan you my bed because I don't need it no more. Next time I show up at a pool, it won't be for sympathy. I'm going swimming. Today can be your day. If you're ready to leave the pool. It's time. Get off the porch. It's time to leave your past. It's time to leave your pain. It's time to leave your strongholds. It's time to leave your barriers. It's time to leave habits that have held you down. It's time to leave mistakes. It's time to get off the porch. It's time for you to leave your system. I know that's how you grew up, but that's systematic oppression. I know that's the first thing you saw, but it's systematic oppression. If what you're depending on isn't providing what you need, it's time to let it go. Someone here today is ready to get off the porch. You're ready to live life differently. People only left the porch two ways. Dead or delivered? Which one are you going to be? They, they had to leave the porch one or two ways. Dead, which means they were carried out. Or delivered, which means they. Identify yourself. You dead or delivered? Identify yourself. I want to hear you say it. Are you dead or delivered? Because let me tell you something. If you say it long enough, you'll start seeing it. <laughs> if you say I'm delivered, you'll start. You, you, those who used to limp, you say I'm delivered, you'll start. If you say I'm delivered, those who used to be blind, you'll start. Say, I'm delivered. Those who are paralyzed, you'll be like the tin man. You'll start to feel a little movement. I want to pray for the delivered folks. Yeah, I want to pray for the already delivered folks. I want to pray for the already not yet. <laughs> you're already delivered, even though you're not living in it yet. I want to pray for you. It, you, you. You're already delivered. Your date just hadn't come. You, you're already delivered. I want to pray for you because I want you to get off the porch. If I'm praying for you, come on and stand to your feet real quick. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for letting us know we can get off the porch. Now, God, I'm praying for the already not yet among us. We're delivered. We're just waiting on the delivery. We already know the deliverer. We're just waiting on the delivery. When the question is asked, do you want to be well? Our answer is already yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Yes to your spirit. Yes to your commands. Yes to your statutes. Yes to your word. God, touch right now my brothers and sisters who stand with me, who are ready to live life differently. We are tired of living our weeks weekly. We want to live our weeks as witnesses to what the power of God can do. Touch right now, God. Look at us by this pool. We don't even have to ask you to trouble the water. Just show up. Because when you show up, we get up. So just show up, God, and we'll stand up. 
And just like the man by the pool, God, even if we got to be healed all by ourselves, I won't lay down to make anybody else feel comfortable. Deliver us for your glory, God. When this prayer is over, we expect to open our eyes as different men and women. And it's all for your glory. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. And all the delivered people in the room said together, amen. Listen, let's all stand. While we're standing, somebody today, you need to meet this Jesus. You need to meet Jesus. You need to know him as Lord and Savior. He knows you. He's wanting you to know him. He's waiting on you to invite him into your heart. The Bible says, if you can confess with your mouth that he's Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He wants to save you today. Bishop T.D. Jake says, you don't have to hide who you were because he died for who you're hiding. You can just be you. Why? Because he died for you. Whoever you are, wherever you are today, on the main sanctuary level, in the balcony, you're ready to receive Christ in your life as Savior. Just If you're upstairs, come down the stairs, come through a door. If you're on the main floor, just tell your neighbor, excuse me, this is my day. The water is troubling right now for me. Maybe you're already saved and you're just looking for a place to call home. You're looking for a church to call a family. We'd love to have you in our family. We'd love to be your brothers and sisters. We love to do life with you. We've been praying for you and expecting you. You fit in here. Because a lot of us still got a little, we still got some traits of sickness that we're waiting on the Lord to heal. We still got some habits we need to let go. Listen, we don't have it all together. Don't, don't you believe? We look good in the sanctuary, but if you can see what's under these clothes, it, listen, if you can see what you can't see, you know you ain't looking that much when you're looking at us. So you fit right in. You fit right in. If you're not perfect, neither are we. If you're still trying to get it right, so are we. If you're still looking for the sun to shine after the storm, so are we. We'd love to have you here today. This is your shot. This is your chance. <coughs> Come on, brother. Come on. I don't want you to leave here the way you came in. And I told you the devil uses subtle weapons to try to distract and destroy you. And he could be distracting you right now, but understand that distraction comes before destruction. But we don't have to let it happen today. So if you're here today and you're ready to make that decision, hear me, I'm getting ready to pray for you. When I'm done praying, we're all going to take our seats. But if you're here today and you're ready to make that commitment to Christ or you're ready to make that commitment to church, I want you to remain standing and we'll give you further instructions. Pray with me again. Father, we're at this point yet again. I've said everything I, I knew to say. I've done everything I know to do. And so now, Holy Spirit, it's on you. Go where I cannot go. Reach where I cannot reach. Touch where I cannot touch. Save where I cannot, deliver where I cannot, draw where I cannot. And we'll give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. When everyone else is seated, give them the strength to stand. And God, we'll receive them like a family should. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said together. <laughs>